Hello everybody, my name is Oli, I'm a junior doctor living and working in the northeast of England and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Just as it goes, I'm now about three quarters of the way through my first block in academic medicine, about seven months into working as a junior doctor I guess. But I'm still getting bombarded left and right by questions, you guys send them in all the time across my social media platforms, so I think maybe once a month or so towards the end of the month I'll just take the opportunity to try and get through as many publicly asked questions as possible in the hopes that you find some of them interesting, so let's just jump right in. Firstly, when are you going to grow your beard? Um, probably not much longer than this, this is about as long as it gets at the moment, the girlfriend isn't overly keen, so it, it doesn't tend to get any longer than this. But looking at myself in the monitor over there, definitely ready for a haircut. At med school, did you find group revision more useful than revising alone? Um, I'm not normally the type of person who likes to study together in groups with other people. As you'll know if you've seen my recent video on how I prepared for finals, the way that I normally revise it for a normal kind of written knowledge based exam is I just sit down and grind out hundreds and hundreds and thousands of, of past exam questions because I think that's what works for me. That's certainly what I'm doing for my upcoming surgical exams. I think there are situations for medical and physician associate students, for example, where you have to do OSCEs or anything that would require you to communicate with another person or to do a procedure or an examination or something on another person. I don't really know how you would do that without practicing in a group with other people because what you really need is the feedback from other people as to your technique and what you're actually doing and how you're explaining things. Because if you're practicing by yourself it's really easy to get into bad habits and you won't necessarily know if you're doing something wrong or inefficiently. What you really need is that responsive feedback and for somebody to be able to tell you. So I would say adapt to this preference I suppose to the thing that you are studying. Most of the time you can do whatever your preference is but I think there are situations in which group study is necessary whether you like it or not. How do you know where to apply for FY1? So FY1, uh, for those unfamiliar, is your first year of practice as a junior doctor when you finish medical school and you start working as, as a proper young doctor. What I generally advise people with regards ranking your foundation jobs is it's a trade-off between three things, right? Two of which are up to you and one of which is less up to you. The first thing is where in the country you want to go. So the UK is split up into geographic areas that we call deaneries, which correspond kind of in the same way that counties do. They split the country into these well-defined geographic areas based on the hospitals that are within them. And so the first thing that you might think about is that if you want to go somewhere really particular, like you might want to go to London or you might want to go to a sort of big city, somewhere like Newcastle or Manchester or Bristol, somewhere like that, or you might want to be in the middle of rural nowhere for your FY1, whatever you like. That's one of the easiest ways to start, or it at least allows you to decide on places that you really wouldn't want to go. The second thing that I would encourage thinking about is jobs, that is the specialty rotations, because your foundation years will consist of six jobs over two years. You'll spend four months in each job, and again, if there are particular specialties that you want to see and want to be exposed to in your junior doctor years that you're thinking of doing as a specialty, then getting a job in that specialty is, is a good idea. Equally, there may be things that you really don't want to do, in which case you could avoid those jobs. So those are the first two things, I think, is where in the country you want to be and what particular jobs you want to do. That's another thing that will help you rank your jobs. The third thing is more immutable. Uh, factors about your situation. So this may be things like you have a partner and you are settled, you maybe have property in an area, you might have children and you might not want to uproot them from their school life or wherever they're set up already. Or you might have caring responsibilities, things that would tie you to particular locations because Ultimately, these are the things that you're going to have to make one and two work around, I suppose. And in fact, if you need to stay in a particular place or you need to be in a particular place, then there are pathways that will allow you to apply for sort of special circumstances to allow you to be guaranteed a job in a particular place. So as a really rough and ready summary, that's how I usually advise people to think about the jobs at a very basic level. I hope that helps. Have you ever failed an exam? I'm in first year and I just came 5% sure on my first SBA. 
Um, look, for what it's worth, pal, I'm really, really sorry that that happened to you. Um, it does happen, obviously, to a certain number of people, often a very large number of people, depending on the particular exam. I remember in, in my first year of med school, like, getting on nearly half the year failed the first year SBA. So in my own case, no, since going to university, so during my undergrad degree and at medical school, I thankfully never failed an exam. But I've just been lucky, you know, that that's the thing. What really matters in medical school, and I know this is a, a bit of a cliche, but you've just got to get through. It doesn't really matter how well you do. If you get 100% or if you just make the pass mark, all that matters is you get through. Medical school is essentially pass-fail. And I would just urge everybody to remember that just because you fail an exam in medical school or you don't get the opportunity you want or you, you perceive yourself to have failed at something, as long as you can learn from what's happened to you and you are more likely to get it right next time, then that's all anybody can kind of ask of you. And it doesn't make any significant difference to your future either. Failing an exam in medical school means absolutely nothing as long as you take the opportunity to improve. So that's getting feedback on what exactly went wrong, taking steps to fix it. For things like SBAs, you might want to look at question banks or speak to your lecturers and your tutors go to revision sessions, look for other resources and try study methods that you weren't using before. As long as you do all of those things, nobody can really ask any more. What is the average age of FY1 and ST1 doctors? Are there age-related common prejudices or biases in the UK? Um, well, I mean, let's do the maths. So we assume that our average university student, our medical student, goes to medical school when they're 18 or they start. Most medical school programs are five years, so your person is going to be 23 when they come out as a, as a junior doctor in August of that fifth year um, after they start. Obviously, there's going to be a degree of distribution around that. You know, lots of people take a gap year. Lots of people intercalate a year as either a bachelor's or a, a master's degree. Um, lots of people are grad entrants to medicine like myself, so you might be two, three, four, five years older, whatever. I suspect, you know, your average FY1 is probably going to be in their mid-twenties by the time they get out of medical school and get into practice. Then ST1, so specialty training 1, you would do your FY1, you'd be, say, 23, FY2, 24. Now, depending on the specialty that you choose, ST1, if you got straight into training, which would be, I think, relatively unusual for a run-through pathway, the ST1 you could be 25, 26. If with this question what you're specifically wondering about is specialty training, for most specialties now it takes two to three years after your foundation years before you can enter higher specialty training. So you would do, uh, say, three years of internal medicine training. So you'd be FY1, FY2, IMT1, IMT2, IMT3, and then go into specialty ST4, or you might do IMT1, IMT2, and go in ST3. Similarly for surgery, you would do core surgical one, core surgical two, and go in ST3. So if we assumed that our FY1 was in their mid-20s, then your core trainee, by the time they become a registrar, you're probably looking at approaching 30, maybe between 28 and 30, I would guess on average. Are there any age-related biases in the UK as far as medical training goes? I genuinely don't think there are. I've never heard of anything like that because I don't really know what the utility of that would be for any particular hiring decision because we go through national selection for virtually everything and there's not any reason especially why you would prefer either a younger or an older trainee because it's more about ticking the right portfolio boxes really. So no, I don't think there are. Is Manchester awesome? Uh, I don't know. I've never worked or lived there. I've only visited it ever, like, twice. I went to visit it when I was looking at medical schools to apply to a very long time ago, and I went to, I think, the Arndale. Is that the big shopping centre? Beyond that, I'm afraid that I know extremely little about Manchester. <laughs> I'm sorry. How many times did you go through PassMed before finals? I went through PassMed completely once, and I went through BMJ on exam completely once. But I think the thing to elaborate on with that is that as you're progressing through the question bank, you're obviously doing the questions that you get wrong multiple times, because if I did 100 questions on a given day, 
then when I did my study session the next day, the questions that I did would be a combination of new things that I'd not seen before and questions that I'd got wrong in a previous study session that I was doing again to try and get it right this time and help embed the knowledge. So completely, I went through the question bank once and saw every question at least once. However, I must have, you know, I must have been getting on 15,000 questions probably by the time I got to finals purely because of the amount of duplicates that you would have seen in that time. What specialty are you hoping to go into? Um, I do sort of semi-often talk about this, but at the moment, so this is me six, seven months into FY1, and this is also what I wanted to do during medical school. I really want to do neurosurgery, um, neurological surgery, that is a surgeon who operates on the brain and the spinal cord specifically. So there's lots of different areas within neurosurgery that people could do. There's things like trauma, functional neurosurgery, you might be a tumor surgeon, you might be a pediatric neurosurgeon, you might do spine. There are lots of different sub areas, but neurosurgery broadly speaking. However, I was talking to a colleague about this very recently. I am also someone who thinks it's really important to have backups in place, and especially with hyper, hyper competitive specialties like neurosurgery, I think it's a good idea to have backups and to think about other things that might interest me, even if they're not perfectly what I want to do at this stage. They are other things that I may need to apply for or want to apply for depending on how things in my life change. So one of the other ones I'm looking at is paediatric surgery. So that's much more similar to being a general surgeon, um, someone who works within the abdomen, but you're working with children, which is its own specialty. And the other one is interventional radiology. So that is someone who, well, a radiologist obviously is somebody who looks at scans, things like x-rays, CTs, MRIs, and reports them. But interventional radiology is the, the more procedural um, subgroup within that specialty who might do things like aneurysm coiling um, if you're a neuroradiologist for example which historically was a, a procedure that was always done by neurosurgeons or at least clipping aneurysms was now a lot of them being done by radiologists instead because I think that interventional radiology there's always going to be huge demand for it it is still very competitive but not on the same magnitude as neurosurgery and whatever I do, I think I want to be in something procedural, tactile, because I really want to be able to use my hands. So I suppose that's what I'm thinking about at the moment, specialty-wise. What in your mind motivated you to start a career in medicine, and is it something that you still think about? Yeah, I actually think about it all the time, not only for myself, but for other people, because as this platform has grown and as I speak to more and more and more medical applicants, I'm starting to appreciate more and more the, <laughs> I think, exactly how ill-informed we all are when we choose to go to medical school. I, I think it's absolutely insane that your 15, 16 year old is having to make the decisions to go to medical school in order to get their A-levels and work experience and all of that in place. I think that's absolutely ridiculous because even as somebody who had been through a degree or was nearly through a degree when I decided to go to medical school as a graduate, at the time, obviously, when I was applying, I thought I knew what I wanted and what I was getting into. And now that I've started working as a doctor and been through medical school, I'm realizing exactly how little we all know, and I'm sure that's a transition that everybody goes through. What I really needed was the opportunity to combine my love and passion and enjoyment for, for the biological and biochemical sciences, but what I really needed was to be working with people. And actually what I found that I really enjoy is doing work that has a direct and tangible impact on the person in front of me. And that's not to suggest that other disciplines don't do that. And in fact, the other disciplines that people do, if we think about people like biomedical scientists and public health specialists and people like that who, who don't often work with a patient sat in front of them, the work that they do actually affects many, many patients and you're doing an enormous amount of health work, um, more so than you could ever help one person in front of you because of what you're doing. But actually, what I've found I like and what works for me is being able to interact with a smaller number of people one-on-one -on -one and feeling as though I'm making a difference 
to them with the work that I'm doing. And that's how I derive value from what I do. That's not going to be the same for everybody. And it's definitely not the same for everybody. I mean, like I say, someone who works in public health and does a trial that shows how good a statin or something is, is going to help thousands upon thousands of people. And that's utterly amazing. It's, it's just not what I want for myself, if that makes sense. How do you deal with the death of a patient? Working in mental health, we don't experience it very often, and I've had my first death of a patient and don't know how to process it. Wow. Um, firstly, I'm sorry, obviously that, that can be really traumatic, especially if you're not used to dealing with it. But I think I would say, and obviously this is based on my own very limited experiences, but especially if it happens in a very acute situation, as it usually, for example, happens when I'm exposed to death, it's in some very busy, very often traumatic, very busy environment, then you don't often get the space to, to deal with it mentally, right? You have to compartmentalize it, put it to one side and, and just do the job for the moment. And not only that, but I think it's possible to be actually affected by death more than you realize you are in the moment because it's a really significant issue. It reminds you of your humanity and how kind of fragile we all are. Different people will deal with death in different ways, but I think it's it's very common and completely understandable for people to be very significantly affected by death, especially perhaps if it was a patient that you knew very well, if it was somebody that you were close to, or for any number of reasons. So what I would say is that even if you don't know how to feel about it, or you don't know how to react to it, or you're, you're just not sure like you say, how to process it, I think that is your opportunity to speak to a senior. So for example, if, if I'm a junior doctor, I might want to speak to um, a registrar or even an SHO, you know, somebody a little bit more senior than me, or even a consultant if I can get hold of one. Actually, in practicality, I think I'd speak to a ward sister or a charge nurse, the, the nurse in charge of the ward, because by virtue of being in their role, they'll have been exposed to it a lot, and they'll have seen lots of junior trainees, be they medical, nursing, allied health professional, dealing or not dealing with, with dying for that reason. And so what I would say is, even if you don't know, and you don't necessarily know that you've been badly affected, or you, you, you're just confused and don't really know what to do, I would say on balance, ask for help, speak to a senior, and, and just try and debrief a little bit, you know, can we actually talk about what happened? I'm not sure how to feel, but I realize that it is significant. And I think by the time you feel that it's significant, it probably is worth discussing because it probably has affected you, whether you perhaps realize it or not. And certainly when I was exposed to a patient who, who died on, on my ward for the first time, that's what I did. I debriefed with the ward sister. And I think that was really helpful, and I've been able to take the lessons that I learned from that forward. So discuss with a senior, I think is what I would say. Even if you're not sure, even if you don't know how to feel, because they've been through it many, many times, and they'll be able to help you. So thanks very much for watching, everybody. That concludes this Q&A for now. We'll do another one in a few weeks' time. If you've got any more questions or you want to react to anything that I've said in this video, just drop me a comment down below and I'll try and get to it as quickly as I can because there's some really interesting questions that come out of things like this. And we're very lucky that we have a very supportive and communicative and engaged group of people who follow this stuff. So I'd love to hear your thoughts and opinions too. Take care and I'll see you in another video.